and welcome to my little uh, stream about the curl 7.70.0 release. You know I'm Daniel, I um, push buttons in the curl project. Uh, so I did uh, the necessary button push pushes earlier this morning my time. I actually did it about two hours ago. So I published everything I think regarding the release. And now I'm doing this little presentation about the details and I'm streaming stuff on Twitch. So feel free to ask me anything on the in the Twitch chat and I'm going to head over to some details about the particular release stuff in a second. <clears throat> so you know you can always find me on Twitter in the IRC channel, curl on Freenode. And we have the mailing lists where you can ask anything that is curl related. And if you have uh, bugs in curl, you file them on GitHub. And if you want to improve curl, you file push, uh, sorry, not push requests, they pull requests on GitHub. So today then I, I started out by, well, I had everything prepared yesterday really. So I, um, I basically just merged my uh, few updates to the release notes and everything um, to, to, to the git master branch and I pushed everything and I built the release package, signed everything, uploaded it. And then when I <laughs> submitted my blog post about it, I wrote the wrong version number in the subject. So now the URL to my blog post about this release has the wrong version number. Fun. But anyway, that's me. Uh, I have a nickname that has a typo in it. So okay. Curl 7.70.0 is release number 191. So I'm getting, uh, I sh I'm supposed to be getting better at it, but okay, I think maybe I am. We I have uh, everything sorted out more and more automatically over time. And now we're, we're starting to get, get uh, sort of polished releases. So, okay, here is the name. 7.70.0 and we're looking at it. Here's my blog post about it. Uh, I'm going to come back to the question about HTTP3. Uh, first, I just want to mention that today I, I did this release 49 days since the previous release, which is seven weeks instead of the regular eight weeks. And we, I used seven weeks just because the previous uh, release was very short and then I to not uh, readjust all the planning or all the dates for the future releases I decided to cut this release cycle off by one week but it doesn't really matter so seven weeks 65 people submitted bug reports push uh, um, patches or or other help so a lot of people and a lot of newbies again I, I found out that 36 new contributors in this release and 19 new code authors or I, I should say people new people that landed commits in git not everything is code could also be documentation updates good morning frank so um the the big things in in the release this time uh might be that uh, we don't have any security fix no that's not a big thing but okay i like it because it's been, we have now a record uh, number of days since the previous CVE we announced, 230, 231 days exactly today, which is a longer time period without CVEs than we'd had in seven years. Seven years then takes us back to 2013, and 2013 was certainly a different era in curl time. So, so uh, while I don't think we're, I mean, we, we, we have never reached sort of the end of security related problems and there will always be more coming. I, th I still think it's good that people at least can't find more very easily. So I'm sure that people will keep on looking for security problems and that's good. And uh, I'm, I'm still happy that we're at this uh, point right now. <clears throat> so that's, that's, a, that about it. that's about it about uh, yeah. security fixes. So the changes this time, well, the counts as four changes, but uh, I think that is basically big 
cause one of the changes are really counted as two. And that, be, and that is because it is actually just mentioned in the release notes, both as a libcurl change and as a command line tool chain. Uh, sorry, I'm speaking and reading things at the same time. Uh, as a command line tool change. So that, that means um, we added support for this option, revoke best effort for the SSL option option. Uh, I don't know how to ex explain it. But it's pretty much an, an option when you're using S channel as the TLS backend to sort of relax the revocation checks a little bit because it turns out that in many times in many surroundings um, the points that provide the the revocation checks are are not accessible and then you get everything revoked or at least the revocation checks don't work properly in S-Channel and this apparently turns out to be a big nuisance for a lot of people using S-Channel and particular than tools using curl built to use S-Channel in different surroundings and I know for example the guys with uh, using the git for Windows they have been suffering from this quite a lot I think so that's one of the bigger users that, and they don't want to switch on this bit to make to sort of make curl not go completely crazy just because you're in a special network surrounding that makes the TLS revocation checks uh, not work as you want them to. Uh, it's a very subtle little thing, but okay. I, I think it'll make <laughs> one application happy and uh, one application with ma potentially many users. So I think it was, was worthwhile. There was a long discussion in that PR uh, and, and bug on, on if the fix is actually good or bad and so on. <clears throat> Complicated stuff. Two of the more, um, I would say, the other two changes are much more user facing and, and uh, you know, subject for people are going to be happy about them or at least try them out and they're going to report bugs very soon, I hope or ideas uh, how we can improve them. And the first one, of course, that we landed was the JSON support for the write out option, which means that uh, if you do, if you write, you know, if you use uh, curl to do regular, um, whatever regular things you do with curl, like you um, write a curl command line and you want to transfer URLs and then you want to get some extra data from that transfer and you, use, you do that with the dash uh, W option or dash dash write out option. And if you haven't found that option yet, you really should dig into that and, and figure out how you can use that in your shell scripts because that's a really uh, fine way to get more more information and more metadata out of your transfer from, from curl without having to resort to doing weird uh, scripting on the side. And, one, uh, and now from this release 7.70.0, you can actually ask for a JSON object to get output, yeah. which then basically outputs all the metadata metadata about the transfer that curl knows about as a JSON object, which, why do you want to do that? Well, because people like JSON, and if you have a JSON parser and a JSON handler, you can easily get a lot of data out of the curl transfer and, and into a JSON object and so on and deal with it. Um, this is the first release and with this feature, I'm sure there will be reasons to ponder about uh, how to do specific things in there, if it's JSON E enough and if there's going, if, if we should have more stuff and less stuff and so on. But it's still, it's the, I think it's a good first JSON step and it'll be fun to see what people think about it and how it's going to be used. Of course, then we have this regular thing with curl that yeah I, I ship this in a release now and it'll take ages until this particular release ends up in a in the distro you're using like in your operating system or something but still it's there it can be used and if you want to you can go get the bleeding edge and try it out uh, there's a similar situation but even worse with mqtt support that we've landed now the mqtt support is experimental as opposed to the JSON. The JSON support is there, it's not experimental, it's landed properly. But the MemQTT support is experimental, which means that it's not there by default, you have to enable it in your build. And we, um, 
we recommend that you don't ship anything in production with this because we don't guarantee any ABI or API sort of behavior or consistency going forward. But we do appreciate if, you, if you're interested in the protocol and use cases with it, you go ahead and build with it and try it out and, and fill with it and, and see how it works and if it works and if it doesn't work the way you want to and if it doesn't fulfill your use cases, let, let us know and, and we can iterate over this and, and perfect it over time because that is sort of the whole purpose with doing this as experimental making sure that we can dip our toes in this water and if it's wrong we fix it if it's good we move ahead in that direction so we can sort of this is really early days and we can change around how we do things without you know having to suffer and, and punishing users a lot because it this is experimental and those are the main changes in this release not particularly major in any way but so we only had seven weeks right <laughs> and to be honest we basically never have any particular major changes in a, in a single release because we have them so often so we don't have time really to do any huge changes within one release cycle coffee uh, okay but well of course I, we also have, I think, is a record amount of bug fixes in this release. Uh, I, my script counts 135 bug fixes, which is a huge amount in 49 days. So, well, it's less than three a day, but still, it's a, a, a shocking amount. <clears throat> but of course, most of the bug fixes are really tiny. A lot of them are uh, on documentation. A lot of them are uh, fixing things in test cases and so on. So it's not as bad as it sounds. It's actually, I think it's a good thing that we're, we're still finding little things to polish all over. And a bug fix is a bug fix. It's more of a binary, right? So it could be a big fix. It could be a small fix. We count them as bug fixes, nevertheless. Some of the more... Um, noteworthy ones I, I would say are the ones that i mentioned in my blog post like the um, we bump the minimum supported GNU tls version that might not be interesting to many people except those who actually use GNU tls as a tls backend so we bumped the, the lowest version to that we support to 3.1.10 which is actually a significant bump because previously we said version 2 something <clears throat> which is an ancient version and this version 3.1.10 was released in March 2013 so it's uh, a little bit over seven years old so still you just need a GNU TLS version newer than seven years and it'll be fine <clears throat> and in our case here we wanted to fix a bug of course in curl uh, using GNU TLS and it happened so that this version introduced a function that was convenient to fix the bug so we just made it easier and, and uh, easy for the for us and just said okay we require at least this version which also made gave us the opportunity to clean up a lot of if defs in the code and i think every do i removed like 300 lines of code in that file just getting rid of those all those conditionals in case you run with these old versions you need to do these blah 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 so not only then do we reduce the number of lines of code, it actually simplifies the code a lot and, and we remove a lot of you know, complexity and, and silly things. So uh, I think it's a, it's a good move. And <clears throat> whatever you do, you wanna have TLS, a, a modern TLS library anyway, because the TLS libraries, if any, in, in the curl stack, uh, they're riddled with security related fixes, right? So if you're using TLS for real in production, production, you really want to have those updated TLS libraries anyway for security reasons. So you, even if you do use GNU TLS, you most probably want something much more modern than 3.1.10 anyway. You should of course use Wolf SSL if you want in particular, if you want commercial support or support for your TLS library, I actually don't know of any other TLS library with as solid support options as Wolf SSL. Um, and I'm not saying that only because uh, I work for Wolf SSL. I think it's also true. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so that was a long story about the GNU TLS stuff. So. Um, 
that was good. And we did other minor things with particular backends. For example, we fixed a thing with the libssh backend. You know, we have three SSH backends too, if you want to have SSH support for like, you know, SFTP. And one of the backends is libssh. And it, had a, it has a funny behavior in that you could make, it can actually read, if you have a config file for the, for the library, um, in your home directory somehow, I think, you know, dot config slash blah, blah, blah. You could actually have, if you use curl with libssh, you could have it read and use that config file instead of using the option you told it to use in um, by we, that libcurl told it to use, which was very confusing. So now it is fixed so that the, oh no, sorry, I'm, I'm talking about another bug. That, that's one bug that we fixed. I did, that's not the one that's mentioned here. Sorry, I'm con completely confused, but that was one bug. So we fixed that bug and then we fixed this thing to use, you know, what well, you probably don't know because you, who, who knows all these details, but SSH and in particular open SSH, they, introduce new funny key types in the known hosts file all the time. So, you know, known hosts is the file um, you have in SSH to know that you're connecting to a known host. Um, and they, they have support, uh, they support key types. So you can do it with different types of keys and they tend to add new types over time. So, um, the SSH libraries have to keep up with that and sort of in this case we have some awareness in curl to have to tell the SSH library which types to use blah blah it's complicated but we fixed it and now a libssh built back and works better with modern SSH installations. <clears throat> Here's another very subtle gem. So, you know, we have the multi SSL support in curl, which means that you can build curl to use one out of several different TLS backends at runtime. So you can build it to use, you know, set it to know about X number of TLS backends. I think, I'm not sure all of them support this, but pretty much you can build with 10 different TLS backends. And then at the runtime, you select which one to use at runtime. So they know about them all and you don't have to provide them all as libraries. But then at runtime, you select which one to use this particular invoke. Again, that is used by, for example, the Git, uh, Git uses it um, and Git for Windows. <clears throat> anyway, when you then went back and you did a curl global cleanup, so basically said, I'm done with everything curl. I don't want to do anything more. You you can now go back and reinit curl to use another TLS backend. So previously you couldn't do that. Previously you could only pick one TLS backend and you would be you would sit with that for the rest of the application lifetime. But now you can go all the way back, change TLS backend and uh, init curl again and use another one. Yeah, sure. And then your question is why would I ever do that? And that is. <laughs> That's a good question. But in, in, it usually comes down to that the TLS backends support different things. And in particular, it support, they support different things on particular operating systems. So for example, if, you, you, if you're on a Windows, I think S channel, the, the Windows native TLS library might have special superpowers that maybe your t open SSL backend won't have and so on. So there might be reasons, but they're subtle and you really need to know those details to know when go with one or the other. <clears throat> and more things about um, Windows. Uh, Windows is um, fun. So back in, actually back in January this year, so like three months ago, we actually released a um, security advisory the, this one, CVE 2019-15601. Um, <clears throat> and the security advisor basically says that if you're using, if you're using curl on Windows and you're using file colon trans URLs, you could trick curl to access SMB 
you can actually use other protocols that's, than SMB2. You could uh, trick curl to access hosts on your network uh, by crafting different URLs, right? So if you, for example, can trigger a remote application to run a particular file colon URL, you can make that application then probe servers on your network. And we considered that to be a security problem and we tried to fix it back then. And we released that in, in January. So we got the report actually late 2019 and that's why the CVE number is 2019. But over time and <laughs> subsequently we got another report by, I forget its name, but it, an excellent report that basically said that check was really not, it was completely insufficient. It doesn't really fix the problem that you identified. So there are these other, I think, I think he listed three other ways that you can actually access servers using the file colon URL on Windows machines. And then basically we gave up. So, okay, the old man, you know, the old thing, it's not a bug, it's a feature. It really hit us hard in the head. So no, it's not a bug, it's a feature. You, can, you simply cannot prevent your Windows machines from probing other hosts on your network if you're trying to access a local file. It's just, we really, I mean, there are, there are a myriad of ways of, of doing that slash slash things to, to, to that Windows itself will translate into a network uh, probe to, to a host name. So we basically then backpedal that and said, no, this is not a security bug. We, we were wrong. We're retracting the CVE from January. It's not a CVE anymore. We've, I've also retracted it at, at uh, Mitre and we've uh, unpublished it from the list of security vulnerabilities in curl and we don't count it as a vulnerability anymore. So that's why we don't have any CVE anymore for 2020. We had that one for a moment and now we've removed it. So now it's gone. Now the most recent CVE is from September, 2019. <clears throat> okay, so that's about it about the CV. I, this is sort of, as I said, I mentioned this before, I think. We, I published something about it on my blog a month ago or whatever it was when we took that decision. And then we, of course, then now also reverted our lame attempts of fixing this problem that isn't a problem anymore because it's not now deemed a feature and we don't consider it a problem. <clears throat> Because on Windows, there's no way for an application to prevent Windows from doing this. So it's sort of, it is a feature, it, it is a design choice by, by the operating system to always allow this and to make it really, really, really hard for an application to avoid it. So we're not going to try to avoid it. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I could also go a little bit into In, in, we've fixed a lot of things in the test cases this round and I, if I look at the change if in the release notes, I think we have, uh, let me count, we have, I think we have 23 bug fixes mentioned in the test suite alone. Or, and it doesn't even include all of them, I think. So maybe upwards 30 bug fixes or so are out of these 135 are for the test suite alone. Um, so we fixed a lot of the test suite and, and in particular with first, of course, Mark Hershken has been around uh, and he has worked hard to make sure that the test suite in general and test cases in particular run better on Windows so that um, they, they can, we can run more tests and the, uh, the tests run more reliably because we still have a problems with flaky tests and that's some of the tests in particular on Windows are not sometimes failing without, without it being a problem in curl, it's just a problem with the test suite. So he's been working hard on that, but in particular, but what I, but I but I have been working on with it in terms of the test suite is also related to the reliability of the test suite that I'm since 
since really the dawn of time, I introduced this particular kind of test suite in curl in, I think, 20, 2001. Um, we had one before, but then I rewrote it. I think it was early. Uh, I think it was for, before I, well, while I did, uh, I had done libcurl for the first time and I rewrote the, the test suite. Anyway, the test suite basically runs a bunch of test servers. Most of them are our own custom servers. So we've written them ourselves. Um, custom servers are the best to use for test, test suites instead of real servers. Anyway, so they run on, on, a bunch of them run on real ports, right? So they're really TCP servers. So we have to connect to them over TCP and we run curl on that TCP port and verify that curl behaves and the server can send whatever good data, bad data, and curl should behave, report error, and you know never leak error, uh, memory and never crash and so on. But anyway, since the test servers are using fixed port numbers, occasionally we run in, into problems because some some of the machines we would run the test suite on would run run. Um, a particular, you know, another server on one of these ports, and when we, over time, we add more and more servers, so we had, we now have a, a use, I think, around twenty different ports, in in a regular test suite round. If you run all the tests, so twenty ports, and they were all allocated in a block, so we would run into problems now and then with people using those ports for whatever reason. And then, of course, okay, we, we added an option that said, oh, you can move this block to another base port. Instead of using 8990 as the base port, you could move it to, I don't know, 20,000 or 30,000, and you would fix the problem on your particular machine that has the conflict. But what, what does this uh, mean for us? Yeah, okay, it means that basically only one in a hundred or one in a thousand would use that move the port number option, which means that we every so often let a fixed port number get into the test suite so you can, can't move that particular test case. And we did this over and over again. So we basically have to move the base port often to make us not let that mistake get in. And another thing with using this fixed base port is that it's really hard to run more than one test server on the same machine or run this test suite multiple times on the same machine without using um, containers or virtual machines or so on. So by using, so I'm, I'm introducing now a, a concept where I, instead of using fixed port numbers, I'm switching over test servers to use a dynamic port number. You know, run a HTTP server on any port you like and tell me which port you ended up on and then the curl will run on that particular port to verify that it works. I mean, that's, we don't need a fixed port number. Um, so I, I'm in, in the middle of the progress of, of doing this transition. So we still use a few fixed port numbers, but we've, I've transitioned over a bunch of the test servers to use this dynamic port allocation system. And it works pretty good. It does, it has a, the little side effect that, um, Two things. First, I don't. Uh, we don't. All test servers we use are not written by ourselves. So, for example, we use OpenSSH for SSH tests, and Open. You can't tell OpenSSH to use any port. Use a dynamic port number and tell me which one you use. Which I think is really silly. Why can't they do that? It seems like a perfectly fine feature. Um, you could, you can do it by using the inetd style. So if you start SSH with from inetd, you can do it, but then you can't do it on Windows the same way because using sockets from standard in, standard out on Windows. So, so for SSH, for example, I, uh, <laughs> I've implemented it the way where it's simply, simply I try out a random port number for X number of times until it works on a port number I just sort of, you know, make up. And tried enough number of times that I, so that it seems likely that it should work on most systems. And I have to do the same thing for S tunnel. S tunnel, <laughs> but but for a different reason. S tunnel actually can uh, listen to a random port number. You can specify port number zero, and it'll pick a, run, a, a dynamic, you know, available port number. But it doesn't have any way to let me know which port number is picked. 
uh, so I, I've actually came up with a way I, could, I can actually add lo the log, uh, the verbose log level for the for the S tunnel logging, and I could grab the logs to figure out which port it used. But it felt really fragile, so maybe on Windows it's going to be hard to read the log file while S tunnel writes to it and so on. And I figured, yeah. You can actually use netstat. Netstat-p also shows which program that open has an open port. So that is also a way. But netstat-p, I bet that's uh, even worse and less portable than all the other options. So I'm switching to the same way with S Tunnel. So I'm going to run S Tunnel and just pick a set of random ports and try them until it works, or give up if I try too many times, maybe ten times, and then give up. And I'm, I think I need to do that for other servers that I haven't written myself. And for all the servers that I have written or that we have code for in the curl suite, I just specify use a random, use any port and write your picked port number in this file and the test suite will pick up the port number used and, and go with it. And it's, it's starting to work and I'm going to continue working on that more. So hopefully by the time I do my little release stream for the next release, I hope I will be able to announce that all port numbers will be dynamic in the test suite. Possibly by if I if I reach that point, then I can also start thinking about doing more than one test at a time on the same machine in the same surrounding, since I can fire up more servers, right? If they use dynamic ports, I can use you know I can run up the HTTP server on ten times and run ten parallel tests if I want to. Maybe I'll think about that. Um, <clears throat> it might speed up some of the tests, at least. So at, le at least on, machi on, on machines like development machines where you have many uh, cores and some of the tests are a bit slow. So why not run more tests at the same time? Could be a, could be a thing to work on. Anyway, so when I introduce this, r run the test servers on any port to then it also <laughs> dawned on me that so we write the test cases in test in files right i'll show you just to illustrate my yeah, i'm trying to so so look at this so here here i am here on the <clears throat> on the right side here you see my emacs window and now it's not in a terminal i just removed all the fancy parts uh, so okay, so if I here's I, I'll tests data. Here's a typical test case, test and here's test, and I can complete it. And there are test numbers, and you can see there are quite a few. I think there are thirteen hundred and fifty something test cases right now. So if we could just go with one, eleven thirty-five. So here's the test case. Oh, that's a boring test case. Not a typical one. 11, 13, 49. Here's a much better test case. So here, here you can see it's SEMA. I call it almost XML. It looks a little bit like XML, but it's really not XML. It's not valid XML anyway. But I use tags and end tags to start sections. But it's, the tags have to have a new line after them. So, okay. Um, so in, in this case, for example, you can see this is a test case and the test case tag, it needs to be run. There's info and there are keywords for the information. And there's a reply that says what the test case should reply. Uh, foo, moo, there's the data that the server is going to send and so on. And here's information for the client. The client needs this feature enabled. Okay, so this particular test needs the debug needs the debug feature enabled, which means it needs to be built de debug enabled. Here's the server it needs for, for the test to run. Here's the name for the test is basically just to show on the <coughs> screen when the test runs so that we know what it does so and so on here's some you can set environment variables you can um, set other command up here's the command that runs with some particular options uh, and so on and, and after the test the case this has run we have a verify section that tells um, the test suite what to verify the protocol 
curl should send this protocol thing. So this is an FTP test. So here's the FTP protocol dump that curl needs to use to be okay. And here's the here's a file it produces and verify that it contains this and um, verify that it contains this in this other file and so on. <clears throat> and I w if I would run in this particular case, then if I want to run 11, thir sorry, sorry, 13, 49, for example, I can run that. Most users will, of course, just run everything, but everything takes potentially a very long time. And if you're like me, you develop something or you refactor something, you want to rerun the particular test, maybe a test that failed or, or you want to debug something, and then you can run like this 1349 and it'll run that particular test case. Some info about the test case and boom, it worked. Some letters about what uh, things it tested, it tested okay, and some data about how long it took and so on. Here's the name, here's the name of the test too. Uh, you think there's this the time for coffee? Uh, you just want to see my coffee break window screen, right? <clears throat> okay, uh, coffee in a few minutes. First, I just wanted to to complete this. So, but anyway, so this is I just wanted to mention this. It's a very long winding way of, of explaining this. So, since this is an FTP response, right? So this is an FTP server. We actually have a, a custom FTP server. It's here, FTP server. And it's uh, it's pretty big, 90k of code in Perl, and it's actually not clean Perl either. It uses a, a C glue to do socket stuff. Anyway, so it's still that's FTP, right? So so the FTP server reads this XML thing to know what to return, but then it turned out that some protocols sometimes need to return stuff about the port number the server is using. So then the server needed to report the new port. You know, I said that this, I'm using dynamic port numbers now. So I need to wait a minute. So all servers need to know which ports they are on so that they can replace variables in the content and so on. So it, uh, it turned out really nasty. And let me see if I can find some example here. Uh, maybe maybe not. I'm trying to think of what I did here. Uh, it, anyway, to make a long story short, the test suite now generates a pre-processed version of the. So this file, as you can see here on the right in my Emacs file, this is the source test file. So when the test script runs, it'll pre-process the entire thing and generate an output version in the log directory. And this output version, that is what the FTP server and the HTTP server and all the other test servers will read and use. And in this case, I bet it's virtually identical. No, it's not identical. Look here. So you can see here for the command here in the source, it uses FTP colon slash slash host IP colon FTP port. So you see these variables here. What are they? They, of course, specify which IP the test server runs on and which FTP, which port number the FTP server runs on. The pre-processed version then has those expanded. So you can see those replaced with the genuine port numbers for that particular test case. So it, used, uh, it ran on 127.0.0.1 localhost and on port 35.5.2.1 in this particular test. If I run it again, of course, it'll fire up the FTP server, it'll pre-process the file and generate a new one for the new port number. So, and if we then look at the pre-processed file again, yep, a different port number this time. <clears throat> and we can also then see in the log file, there's this commands.log file, which logs exactly which curl command that ran in the test case, like this. And then we can see here, the FTP URL it used in the test case also uses that port number, of course, so we can see that it actually worked with that dynamic port number.
So that is uh, things I've worked on in the test suite. Um, this pre-processed thing, it's there and, and the, the HTTP server, the, the, what I call the FTP server, actually for all the ping pong protocols that I call them, FTP, SMTP, IMAP, POP3, they're all on dynamic ports. The RTSP server, the SOX proxy server, um, they're all on dynamic ports right now. I have PRs pending for the SSH server for S tunnel, which then means for HTTPS. Uh, well, basically all the TLS protocols should switch to dynamic ports. So I, there's the, just a few. There's the SMB test. There are HTTP2 tests. There are a few other tests that are still on fixed port numbers, but I, um, I'll get to those, I think, within soon. So maybe soon we'll, we'll be fully dynamic port numbers in the curl test suite. Cool, right? Um, <clears throat> So, um, where am I on my little run through here of bug fixes? Okay, so let's, let me do this. I'll explain one little thing about and one bug more and then we'll, I'll just rest my voice and have a quick coffee break. So, another thing, actually one thing that is still, I landed, when was that? Uh, I landed support for parallel transfers in um, so here's the blog post about it in um, I call it there it it shipped in curl 66.0 here it says in September 2019 so what is that seven months ago so um, it is support for curl to do parallel transfers using the dash capital Z or Z or whatever you say. <clears throat> so basically it, it lets curl transfer all the given URLs in parallel instead of serial, serially. So you know, URL, 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 why wait for the first to complete before you start with the second if there, if there are nothing that makes them rely on each other so you can get them all at the same time and in many cases it'll complete the transfers faster anyway i don't think this is a feature people are using widely yet at least um, so someone found out that if you use in particular if you use the parallel max option which limits the parallelity you know how, how many transfers it'll do in parallel by default i think it does what did we set it to? 50, up to 50 in parallel. So if you limit that, um, you would end up with a lot of transfers ending up with zero byte output files without them actually failing. It was just stupid logic internally, which is now fixed. And I actually got in a second bug report. I, I think it was an identical duplicate of the bug just yesterday, and <laughs> which gave me the bonus opportunity to say, oh, this looks like a bug we already fixed. It'll ship tomorrow, which is, an, oh, uh, it felt good. That's a good round trip time. So hopefully uh, parallel transfers will now be a little bit better and uh, hopefully more people would use it. I, I think one of them still, um, still sort of the biggest room for improvement when it comes to parallel transfers is that we don't have any good error reporting when you do many transfers. If you want to transfer, you know, hey, I want to do 200 files, do them 50 in parallel one of them fails okay how do how should curl report that one out of those 200 files failed and what do you do, what do you want to do about it so and right now it's just hidden and not at all very um, good for scripting and, and for users so we still should work on that someone should so I still have a few things that mentioned in the blog post that I wanted to highlight. And I, I think I have a few more in, in the release notes I could also go into. And I got the question about HTTP 3 and I'm going to come back to HTTP 3. But first, a short coffee break, right? So um, 
Here's a mandated coffee break. Everyone take a minute and go uh, refill your coffee cups. Okay, I'm back and we, um, we're talking curl 7.70.0, 7700, um, this is release 181, which makes the next release an even C0 hexadecimal number, of course. <clears throat> Still then, um, eight, nine releases, more until 200. So maybe we should, uh, we would do, do like uh, release 200 in a year or so, I guess, if we keep up. Typically we do every release, of course, uh, every eight, we do releases every eight weeks, so it's easy to count. Nine releases, nine times eight, that's like 52. 9 times 8 is, uh, is even 72 weeks, so okay, one and a half years until uh, curl release 200. Uh, we don't really stick to 56 days between every release <coughs> all the time because I mess up sometimes and have to do a patch release. Uh, but if, uh, if things go according to plan, we're talking release 200 in uh, 72 weeks. Woohoo! Okay, so I, I wanted to uh, mention a few other, but let me just then, as I got the question a while ago about HTTP3, I'll, I could just squeeze that in, because uh, who's in a hurry here, right? Um, HTTP3 is not final, it's not done, this final specification is not done, draft 28 is pending. So everyone, every current implementation, maybe not every current, but if you run, uh, if you run uh, curl, if you run Firefox, if you run Chrome or Edge, and 
even Safari on a, some one of those tech preview things, you use HTTP 3 draft 27 right now. And that is not the final one. There's a 28 coming, as I said. So when's the final one going to come? <clears throat> Your guess is as good as mine. It's not going to be this month, this month, but uh, uh, I was hoping for mid <clears throat> 2020 before. I think that is uh, uh, not going to happen, but who knows? Maybe by the end of the year, maybe before the end of the year. I, I think it's um, it's really, really difficult to say. But it's I think my impression is that the, the details are, I mean, the changes that are done in the spec, um, they're sort of narrowing down more and more at least. So we're we're closing in at some point. There's going to be a final version of HTTP 3. So it is a good time to dive in to actually try out HTTP 3 to wor start working on it because HTTP 3 is going to be similar to what we have right now, even if details are going to change. But so it's not going to move substantially. And curl supports HTTP 3, of course. You can use two different backends the quiche backend and the ngtcp2. And GHP3 backends, and they both work, both have their subtle bugs still, and they both have outstanding to do's to work on. So, if you want to help out with the bleeding edge protocol stuff, uh, I don't have any chocolate. Hmm. Uh, uh, so, if you want to help out with the bleeding edge protocol stuff, there are a lot of HP3 work to do. And just today, in honor of curl, the curl release, of course, Microsoft announced that they have open sourced their quick library, which also happens to be written in C and is MIT licensed called MS quick. So we can actually, we could, someone could introduce a third quick backend to curl with, to use MS quick, which might be a good idea for, um, for Windows users going forward. Um, there were a bunch of they, their version of, of um, uh, sorry MS Quick works actually in multi platforms. So you can actually build and use MS Quick on Linux too. So that's the reference to the chocolate discussion here in, in the chat. Well, HTTP 2 shipped in May 2015, so it's going to be more than five years between 2 and 3, no matter what. So I wouldn't call it that soon. But HTTP 3 has been in progress for uh, several years or all, several years already. And if you want to read up on HTTP 3, you should read HTTP, ex HTTP 3 Explained, which I wrote. <clears throat> okay, so other things we fixed in this curl release 7.70.0. I need to re, uh, re say the name because I, as I said, I wrote it wrong already several times. It's 7.70.0, sevens and zeros. I added two fields in the version struct that you can get back. If, if you write a, a lib curl using application, you could use curl version info and get info back about the particular curl version that you're using. Um, version number and a lot of information about which features that are enabled, which third party dependencies and their version numbers and so on, um, which is really handy since libcurl exists in so many different build versions and, and variations so whenever you have an, a particular application that uses libcurl you don't really know exactly what features your particular libcurl actually supports so you can check that out at runtime and you can if you want to report bugs figure out version numbers of your third-party dependencies like the tls libraries or, or whatever idn libraries or ssh libraries and so on and starting now, you can also ask curl which CA store paths it uses by default. So if if uh, you build at, at configure time, curl figures out which CA paths to use for the CA uh, certificates when using TLS, and then it uses that internally. And now you can actually ask curl to tell it, tell the application about which paths it uses. 
which is good for application that, for example, uses different libraries or different uh, components that they all want to use the CI store. And it could, it's good to, it's one way to ensure that you're using the same CA paths with curl as with the other components. Now we can ask her which one, which one is you, you are you using, use this with the other ones and, or the other way around. Anyway, <clears throat> that was a good fix. It was an easy one. And uh, we also made sure that it turned out that we, we support Unix domain sockets for Windows since a while back and Windows added support, Windows 10 added support for Unix domain sockets, which <laughs> is funny because it's called Unix domain sockets. But um, Windows 10 added support for them like a year or two ago. Uh, in some Windows 10 version, they've enabled it. So we enabled support for that in curl too. So you can connect some FTP uh, servers, for example, allow you to connect to it over a uh, Unix domain socket instead of over TCP if you're running on localhost, right? So it's basically a way to shortcut the TCP stack. But it turned out that we hadn't it's a build issue thing. So it wasn't enabled in all the builds. So some people accidentally ran curl without support for Unix domain sockets while they didn't have to. I also, so we have, I've, I've fixed up a few scripts in, in, in curl. And in particular, I've, I've highlighted two of them here because a while ago, Daniel Gustafsson, um, fixed our check source script. Our check source script, it's the script in curl we use to verify code style, basically verify C code style actually, C and headers and, and code. It's a pretty bare bones script. It doesn't actually verify everything. It verifies a few things, but it's a pretty handy script to, to run in the CIs, for example, and it highlights where people don't follow our code style or, you know, where the spaces should be when you write an if or where and you, some of the comments where the braces should be and some indent level things. Not everything and not uh, a complete thing, but enough to sort of highlight for new users that they're not following our standards. And we don't have to do that, you know, by spending human eyes on, on just to tell people they're not following the code style. So this is a tool for everyone. You can just, if you run like this, if you go to, um, you got to use this. If you, so if you use make check source, and I can't spell, of course, if you use make check source for curl, it'll just run the tool on all the code in, in curl, which, uh, which is handy, for example, um, if you've edited code or you want to submit a pull request or whatever, you, you can run this and verify that your updated code is actually still possibly following this code style in curl. This is a commonly forgotten by, uh, by uh, contributors, of course, because it's maybe not obvious. If you build curl with enable debug, it'll run check source automatically on all code when you run. So when I do this, when I build curl, it'll run check source automatically like this. You can see it says so here, beep, beep. So it makes sure that um, not only does the code build, it also follows fundamental, well, the rudimental, <coughs> the basic stuff uh, in the curl source style guide. Anyway, that's a long winding way of saying that this tool also has support for checking the copyright in of files, right? So if you go, for example, um, if you would, here's a very fundamental part of the curl url.c, so, and it has a header, source header, right? So there's a copyright header here. It has a year range for which years um, the copyright applies to. And <clears throat> the the um, check source script can actually verify and it uses git to check for the latest change and it verifies that the end range here is the same year as the last change so if i would if i would say, say 2019 here and i have a script that verifies that it's true you can actually if you 
if you run um, checks shows check source here. No, right, I switched it off. But anyway, if you would do that and you have the check enabled, it would re it would warn on this and say, hey, it's the wrong year. But it turns out that it's a pretty slow check, so it take it slows down. If you do it in every build, it's a little bit annoying. And um, when I try to enable it in the CI builds, um, it turned out to be really annoying because this is, of course, people don't. Uh, your ordinary everyday contributor won't update that field, so you'll get, a lot of contributors would get warnings and errors on this, and they would, hey, what's happening? I, and I didn't do anything here. What's why is this my problem? And it turned out to be really really annoying especially when switching over like right the first pull request you know early january everyone has this wrong and it also turned out to be really hard when we do reverts so if you revert yeah so yeah it turned out to be now we had to switch it off by default basically so and i also switched off in my builds because it was too slow and too many users then miss this and since we don't have it enabled in the ci's we miss this every now and then, and people land code with this wrong, and it would warn in my build, but nobody else would have the warning. So, really annoying. So then I wrote, wrote this script instead called scripts copyright. And this is more covering, this goes through the entire Git repository. It actually goes over all the files that are added to Git, and it'll verify that they have the right end year in the copyright range in the headers that they have. It actually verifies also that all files that should have these headers have headers. Uh, I, I mean, so that they have the copyright information at all and then that the copyright information is correct. And I then have a whitelist concept that says that these files don't need to have a copyright header. 2,206 files don't need to have a copyright header. How many files do we have? This files. We have 3,245. So okay, 3,000 files, and we have two. So okay, it checks about 1,000 files in that script and verifies so we, that the copyright range is correct. And so it turns out a better way. So now I can basically just make remember to do this roughly once per release cycle it'll be fine and then i can batch update those that are wrong and as you can see then now all of them are presumably correct <laughs> unless i messed up but uh, they should be much better than before at least and i also added a mention about running this in my release procedures i have this um, checklist release procedure what to do how, how to release curl so i i, I, I read this through every time I do a release. So just remember that I don't, <laughs> as I said, I've done releases many times and I messed them up so many times. I actually have to, I wrote a checklist for myself to make sure that if I just follow this checklist, which I don't always do because it just struck me that I haven't followed this, I haven't done this yet. But anyway, so um, it's not updated to the current year automatically. It is updated to the current year if you've updated the script, the, uh, if you have changed the file this year. So it, it, all the files that haven't been updated, it won't touch. So if you find a file that hasn't been updated, it won't report those, of course. So if, if we like this, I don't know, really, is R to revert the order? Uh, um, I bet we have some old header That was not to reverse the order. Um, gopher, can I go, is there a gopher? That age maybe? Look, it's not a copyright to 2020, it's 2019. And it says 2019 because we haven't updated it to, and nobody has touched this file this year. So it says 2019 because it was touched last year. And that is what the scripts make sure that it should only warn if the end year 
is not the same as the modification year. I know in a lot of projects, people update this to the latest year, you know, 1st of January, run through the project, update all the copyrights to the latest year. But I have a hard time to justify that. So I think that is not really correct. So I could, if you would do this, git grep copyright. So we, for example, here, look at this, 2016. That wasn't, hasn't been updated in a while. So in the file, we have a lot of copyright texts. And as you can see, a bunch of them are not up updated in 20, in several years. So here you can see there's a bunch of them varying years because they haven't been updated since then. It's not legally required to have a copyright notice everywhere, but it makes things much easier because if people copy things out of the tree um, and people do uh, repeatedly, and if they do, the, the, they have a copyright file and notice there so that you can easily see where it comes from and what the copyright information and sort of uh, what goes with this file. So it's not actually legally required, but it's more like it more of a helpful case to make sure that the copyright information follows those particular files in those cases where they get a life of their own. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it may, it's sort of, it makes everything easier. Now it's the information is clear in so, but the, uh, as I said, there were still 2,000 files without copyright information. And for example, that I showed you the test cases from before, they don't have test one. There's no copyright information in the test case. But uh, in this case, I, we have, as I mentioned, we have 1,300 test cases. Uh, I figured it, was, it would have been too much of an overhead to have the copyright header on 1,300 more files. Um, and I don't think these files will have a life of their own outside of curl. Uh, because they're useless outside of curl. So I um, yeah, decided to not do that. And I don't remember the copyright. It has a, as I said, it has a white list. So I have a bunch of other files too that are um, explicitly allowed to not have copyright. Oh, right, the documentation, documentation for example, in, in the docs directory, we have a lot of docs. For example, um, HTTP three markdown, and that two lacks the copyright header. So anyway, that's what I did with the copyright script. So now I can check for copyright range mismatches easily, or I should do it once every release cycle at least. And if I do it just once every release cycle, I don't have to um, do a lot of, you know, fix up, I fixed the copyright year range thing again. So now I can just sort of, you know, reduce the number of silly commits to just basically one per release cycle. And and realistically, they should be fewer and fewer uh, over the year, right? Because now we have a lot of files already updated to 2020. So over the year, there should be fewer and fewer that needs to be updated. Realistically, I don't know, we'll see. And another fun thing that I fixed in this, uh, another fun script that I fixed in this release that uh, really, really will not affect many people. Well, two things, I believe. First, Frank fixed, you know, I have this contributors script, which is a fancy way Uh, okay, uh, it's, a, um, it's a script that actually checks the, it figures out the most recent commit in curl and then it, it uh, parses the git history since that and it does some other magic to figure out who has contributed to curl since then. And it gets the numbers from the release notes file and it all shows them all and outputs them all like this. And this script now also takes the, um, the web 
curl, the, curl, um, the Git repository for the website so that some of these contributors actually contributed to the website contents and not only to the curl uh, source repository. And Frank helped me with that. So that was a, a good addition for my scripting this release around. And then I fixed myself. I, I did a release notes script, which is even more uh, narrow use case. So I, you know, this is the release notes file. It looks like this. Basically, it's uh, I have some metadata at the top, and then I have I, I, mean, I highlight the changes in this release, which are basically things that are improving curl and that aren't just changing existing behavior. They're, they're not bug fixes. And then, then there are the bug fixes. Bam, like this, 135 of them here. And all of these can potentially have a reference, like here's a MQTT reference to 57. And then I could go down and see 57. It's down here. Oh, that's the URL to the particular issue. And then you can see, oh, okay, we have, we have a bunch of references. So roughly everything we do have a reference. So I run the SVS server, SWS server here. SWS is the silly web server in the test suite. So, okay, that's reference 85. So then you can hit down to 85 and you can read follow that uh, link if you want to and you, that would hit over to issue 5247 and you would read about it. Anyway, I I, um, I basically update this file every week or so and push it to the repo and I do that so people who, who update from Git uh, they would go get a reasonably updated version and, and find out what's new in, in this. And you, it was also updated. Um, if you go on the, to the website, it's also always, uh, if you go to this, in the development part of the website, you can see the pending release notes. And this, of course, right now is a lie because I haven't restarted the release notes. So it's actually Right now, the release notes in the Git is wrong because it's still the old Git uh, release notes for the release I did this morning. Still, it'll look like this because it'll render this automatically from the Git content. So in a few days, you can reload this file and you will find out what's cooking and pending for the next release, right? The next release is due in on June 24. But in order for this to work, then I need to push updates to release notes every now and then so that this web page is um, at least decently updated. And of course, we also have these uh, daily snapshots, right? So if you go to daily snapshots on the website, you can download a tarball of uh, the latest curl from that particular day. We update this every, this is of course entirely automated, but you can still go here and instead of using Git, you can get a, a tarball of curl, all the source code, as if it had been a release. So you get, you know, a configure script and everything generated. And this looks exactly as a release would look like um, of that date. So that then also has the correct release notes in it and so on. So it's fairly, I consider it a, a, a decent service to make sure that the release notes file in Git is sort of kept up to date every now and then. But it, it struck me that it was kind of an annoying um, work to have to update this manually. So first, first I got help. First, I actually, nowadays I always use this um, git uh, message when I sync it. I, didn't, I don't do it for releases. You can actually see the release update and the sync update. And then so, uh, I got help. So I have a particular Git alias that actually uh, it's called latest. So it actually shows the Git log since the previous release notes synced commit message. So in this case, I didn't do sync, but this shows what happened since the last commit message that says synced. Okay, I started with this and then I manually added things. And for all commits in curl, you can see, here's a, here's a typical example. We fixed this script. So the, the first line 
of the commit message is basically suitable for the release notes. The, here are people helping out. They're suitable to get credits. Uh, here M Emil Engler and Ashwin met Pali, both should get credited as contributors. And here are references, right? So fixes is the bug report, closes is the pull request. We usually prioritize the bug report, so maybe should be a re reference to this. And in this case, we have another one up on top of here. It has a different fixes because he prefers to use the full URL version. But that's also a reference to a bug report and to a pull request and, and so on. And in this case, for example, here, we don't have any bug request, uh, sorry, bug report, we don't have the pull request. So there are different kinds of um, commits and they all follow the commit template we have in the project. But, uh, and uh, some people use the signed off by thing here and that's fine too. And of course, we also credit every author, uh, commit author and uh, and actually commit committer too, and so on. So, but I, I used to do this manually, so I would copy this and would I make sure to add a reference to this in when I <clears throat> and I would do this, like I said, every week or so. And then when when I'm done with it, this list of bug fixes in the release notes I nowadays I sort it alphabetically so that they will be grouped so you can find all the up value bug fixes next to each other instead of getting them in a you know chronological order because chronologically it doesn't matter at the time of release in which order they were done you base if you want to find a fix you're more concerned about finding a fix and not in which order anyway um now I have a script that does most of this work for me. So if I run this release notes right now, it won't work because it's wrong, but still it'll now update the release notes file for me and do basically all of what I said, but automatically. So in this case, then it'll have, it goes through all the commits done since the last synced message and he'll add them as proposed entries in the release notes file here and with references and he'll do the references below correctly and it has this new entries are listed above this so I can just go through this top list and remove all those that are wrong or update them accordingly and in this case I know they updated a lot of them wrong so I know, you see, uh, these are not correct either right I don't, I don't want them as mentioned bug fixes. So when I'm done with this, going, I'll just rerun the script like this, clean up, and it'll go through and clean up the file again. And we'll see what it did. So the ones I <laughs> left, you can see here it added a few things, proposed um, release notes updates that I didn't spot or didn't remove and it sorted them in there and then added references to them blah 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 it made it much easier for me to maintain the release notes file <coughs> or update it so that's cool still I'm pretty much the only one who's going to use that script but anyway I did it for myself and it works really good. At some point, someone else might want to play with it. <clears throat> Otherwise, again, oh, I closed it. The release notes file. A lot of fixes. I mentioned a bunch of them. Um, what I can possibly also mention or highlight, of course, that isn't really visible in this um, list of uh, source code changes is that we've fixed a few other things, right? So most notably that I've worked on, for example, on the curl website recently. First, of course, um, it says that the latest version is 7.70.0. 
7.70.0 is the new release of today. Huh, I could say the version correctly, at least once. So it updates automatically, actually. So when I update everything, the scripts on the site updates and finds it. So this counter says zero of the list of downloads are of the latest version, because that particular script will check how many of the downloads it refers to from the download page that are updated. So it'll check that twice a day, I think. So it'll take a while until it updates the all of these um, entries. So they, the 769.1 was the latest one until this morning, right? So lists a lot of downloads on this page. And I updated, so now it says uh, MQTT on this list because you can enable it. I also actually noticed that RMTPS wasn't included in the protocols here, so I added it because this list of protocols mm, should be 25 if I mention all the protocols, all the transfer protocols, or actually possibly URL schemes that curl supports for transfers. Um, <clears throat> okay, and I wanted to mention that, of course, <clears throat> the dashboard that I added, or that I've worked on and, uh, recently, so the, this curl.hacks.se slash dashboard.html is just a bunch of generated graphs with information about the curl project and curl source code, curl project, curl contributors, git, mailing lists and so on. And uh, as you can see, there are a bunch of them. There are many of them now. Three and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine times three, there are 28 different graphs and they're updated daily. And uh, most, well, some of them are generated with information per release. Some of them are inf uh, updated with information from Git. Some of them are updated with information from elsewhere. Um, anyway, they, they show how, how we're doing, what's happening and uh, I've had a lot of fun creating them because I think this is interesting graphs. I'm working on a separate presentation that I'm going to do within soon called the state of curl 2020, where I will use a lot of these graphs and talk about them in more specific details. I usually I've done these the state of curl presentations in the curl up conferences in previous years. So I'm there's supposed to be a curl up 2020 next not this weekend, but next weekend, but I'm not quite sure even yet how we're going to do that or, or so. Still, there's a bunch of graphs here and you can click on them each and you can get them in very high res. They're all in SVG actually, so they're, they scale pretty well. You can use them, you can zoom in pretty good. And yes, it made me have to get into GNU plot pretty extensively to understand how to generate these um, and that was fun. Announced the fixed CVs. I told you we have a record. This flat top plateau up here, 231 days today, a very long flat period. Hasn't been that flat since back here. And it doesn't look flat because of the way I draw this line is actually not flat in, <laughs> in the graph. But still, here's between two different CVs. They were over 300 days back then, but 2013, you see that we were at, what, 15 CVEs back then. It was a different universe. Now we're on 92 CVEs. <clears throat> Another fun graph is this one, which shows, um, this shows how long time, the, the bars here, how number of days the flaw existed in the source code until it was found and fixed or reported and fixed. So we can see that a lot of the CVEs existed in the source code for, well, the record one here is 6,000 days, almost 7,000 days. And, and this graph above here, the green one, shows the age of the project. So basically at this, 
this particular flaw, number 74 maybe, existed in almost the entire project's lifetime when found and fixed. So uh, I don't know why, I, I, just, <laughs> I just like this graph. And it shows that even though we are many eyeballs and many, many people are looking for bugs, many of the security bugs, they have lingered in the project for a very long time when people find them. Um, yeah, and I, I, speaking of graphs, I, I, I'm, I've showed this before, but I can show you again because I'm so happy with it. So I'm, I'm particularly like, when I talk about vulnerabilities, I like this graph too. This is uh, vulnerabilities in curl, if you can see them on the horizontal here, the 92 is the most recent one from September. And if I scroll to the right, I can sort of, it's, it's a very wide table. And, you, and here are uh, graphs showing like a waterfall here for the affected versions. So you can see, okay, this particular one affected 765.3 back until it was introduced here in 752.0, this particular one. So you can see here, I like this waterfall graph thing. It's impossible to get an overview of, but it's still here. So you can see all the particular <laughs> flaws get lost in them. And, and, uh, and of course, uh, all these graphs start at some point, and then you can see which ones that added the most number of flaws. And in and the rightmost column, you can see a, a counter for the number of flaws we have found in a particular version. You can see the, the worst version ever, security-wise. 54 flaws found in... 7.34.0. So, and here are all the flaws we found in this particular version of curl. Released December 2013, back in 2013 again, right? Anyway, and here's the full list of all, all CVs ever reported to curl. The most recent ones in September 11. 2019. And of course, if you look at these bugs, you will see that probably none of these recent ones will ever affect you or your use case because they're really niche. Uh, yeah, yeah, FTB, Kerberos, double free, uh, basically impossible to trigger. TFTP, small block size, heap buffer. Probably won't ever actually hit any users. Yeah, you could insert some code with OpenSSL on Windows. Possibly, I don't think it was ever exploited, and so on. So a lot of these flaws, yes, they're security related. They could be exploited and used in some ways, but for most users, never. And then we have a lot of these uh, integer overflows yeah if you if you would pass a two gigabyte password and when you used ntlm it could wrap a counter and do something bad but two gigabyte password i, I think that is rare uh, i could then also just mention that we of course we have a bug bounty so if you go to this url here you can read about the bug bounty and I'll give you the URL here uh, because the bug bounty is fun and you could earn money. When it, and if you go to the bug bounty page, you would go to, you see that, see all details, it would go to Curl's Hacker One page. It looks like this. It is hosted by Hacker One, so you would go here. Oh, it's very zoomed in, so um, that looks better. So you would go here and you would press this submit report and you would. Uh, submit all the details and you will get, if you submit an, a genuine uh, security problem, you will earn money for your bug. It actually says here that the average is 200 and that's true. The average is 233, I believe. Why does it say 200? We've handed out $1,400 on six bugs. So this is <laughs> just broken math. It doesn't matter. We're, that's a little bit of a, is, the downside with saying this is that we're we're trying hard to raise the limits now. So we, we gave out $400 for the most recent bug and we're going to give even more um, 
bike bound is going forward. So it's going to be, you're going to earn more money as we're getting, getting more and more sort of, you know, safe that we're not handing out too much money, that we have enough money to hand out and we're getting more money than we're spending right now. So we're going to spend more money on bug bounties. So if you find a security problem in curl, you can be sure to, that you will get a, I, I think I can more or less promise that you will get more than $500 for the next security flaw you find, unless it's really, really simple and stupid, but uh, I don't think you can find really, really simple and stupid bugs in curl right now. Not security related, I think. I'm trying to jinx this a little bit by saying stuff like this with the hopes that someone of you will think that I'm stupid and, and uh, naive and you will go and find them and report them and get money because that's pretty much what we want, right? <clears throat> okay, so that is uh, curl 7.70.0. This was fun. Um, there's going to be a new release. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the next release will be 7.71.0 because I think we will land changes. I'm not sure that we actually have a pending change coming. So if we're, if things will uh, end, if things end up a little bit differently, we might do a 7.70.1. I'm not sure. As, I, as you can understand, we're using the minor number to bump if we add things. If we change things, we bump the min minor number, otherwise we just bump the patch number. Um, so we will see what happens. It, it depends a little bit on, on what you, my friends, will, will provide and uh, what we get time and, and things to work on. <clears throat> I think if we go back to, if we go to, for example, to check out the pull requests on curl, zoom out, the, <laughs> the window I'm showing you here in my stream is on my low, <laughs> on this, on, on the, win on this, my, I have two different monitors on my table one is a high res and one is much lower res so moving them between screens means that i have to zoom in and out quite a lot so that's why i sometimes have to zoom in and out <clears throat> or zoom out yeah but i can is the way i did that graph i really can't flatten the curve since it's up to uh, it's up to nine, 92, I can't go down from 92. <clears throat> I need to come up with a different way maybe to il illustrate that. I'm actually also pretty happy that I'm at six consecutive curl releases now without any security uh, vulnerability report since we retracted the one from uh, January. So now we're zero 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 six zeros in a row and I'm, I'm very happy with that i'm sure i get a reason to do one soon but uh, i actually also pretty much i, I so, oops uh, where am i wrong i wanted to show you i also like this particular graph there are too many graphs five columns uh, i like this graph which shows cves per year so in particular here it shows that this is 2020 right so the uh, it's totally blank for now because we have zero cves in 2020 we had what is it seven last year and as you can see, 2018, we had more than 10. I think it was 12, 12. And 2016, we had 24. So at least I think that development is really awesome. 2016, this uh, huge bump came from, we had a security audit done by an external party, Q53, they found, I believe they found seven or eight ones that ended up as CVEs at just one blow. We did one release in 2016 with where we announced uh, we announced 
11 CVEs in a single curl release. Never done that many before, never done that many after either. And we're, as you see, we're, yeah, we've flattened the curve here for 2020. Pretty good, <clears throat> I think. And I've, uh, I'm, try I'm working to come up with more graphs that show, show how we do in the projects. The idea being here that I want to have a, a dashboard that basically like this, if you go here, you get a full screen of graphs that show how we do in the project. Basically, I want the, the development graphs to, to grow and the bad things to shrink and the for things to, yeah. And this, I want this to be this, how are we doing today? If I come back to the project in a year, this should give me a quick glimpse of how we're doing as a project and not just me then or that how we all are behaving and progressing and yeah a lot of GNU plot here all of these are of course in this new uh, github repository the stats repo in the curl org so all those scripts and everything is uh, of course available here so if you want to generate your own set of graphs you can do that perfectly well using these. Most of the scripts are Perl scripts generating CSV files, and then there are plot, GNU plot scripts using those CV fi CSV files to generate the SVG outputs. And I'm using SVG also partially because they make the smallest outputs. So these even the more fancy ones like uh, this one uh, they're really small they're just a few kilobytes per image and whatever image format other than svg i would use they would generate much bigger images so if it, for these cases uh, basically just a few hundred k for 30 really detailed graphs pretty nice and you can do this data view here, and then you can download the CSVs for every graph that you can see. And the CSV is then the, uh, the updated one for this particular day. So you can actually, if you want to generate your own graphs, get the CSV that I produced uh, this morning. All in a, an effort to make sure that everything is reproducible and shareable and you can do whatever you want. So I'm going to call this a stream, I think. Uh, I'm at one hour and 37 minutes, something. I think that'll have to do for today. Uh, this is the release 7.70.0. <clears throat> and I, again, I, I just want to emphasize that MQTT is experimental, but I, if you have use cases for MQTT, if you have devices or anything that speaks MQTT and you want to play with it with curl, do that. And if curl doesn't do the uh, work the way you think it should work with MQTT, tell me and tell me how you would like it to work. And we can work on polishing this going forward. But because I'm perfectly sure that it doesn't work exactly the way it should, because uh, it's still early days and uh, uh, I'm not an MQTT wizard. Uh, I just uh, play one on TV. And you should check out Wolf SSL as a library and as a company. And you should make sure that you, yeah. you as your company, buy your curl support from me and via Wolf SSL if you, when you need help with curl, anything, bugs, new features, support, holding hands, fixing your shit. And uh, that's it for this time, right? Um, see you in another stream there will be more i will have webinars and talks coming up and i will announce them uh, on twitch and primarily on uh, twitter but also on my blog so follow all of that and you will find out what i'm up to and uh, there will be more curl fun going forward uh, see you soon bye